This is Jimmy Powers, and happy to be coming your way with another Grantland Rice story. Hi there, this is Jimmy Powers transcribed with another chapter from the Grantland Rice story, The Tumult and the Shouting. Today we're going to hear about television and sports. Granny called it Sportlight Films, and I'll narrate in first person. Whatever identity I've enjoyed from my byline, the Sportlight title board on movie shorts has given me contact with countless moviegoers who may not know a ninning from a goalpost and care less. Women, particularly, have been entertained by sporting action on the screen, and I believe these experiences they have shared have given them a keener appreciation of sport in general. It was back in 1920 that I ran into Jack Fenton in New York. Jack was a motion picture man with ideas. I was a sports writer with a solid 20 years of background in my field. Jack suggested we make a series of one-reel sport motion pictures with John Hawkinson, a fine cameraman and a hard worker. The films would be called The Sport Light after the column I had been syndicating since 1913. Right here I want to say we were fortunate in that we could count on the friendship of Bob Jones, Jack Dempsey, Bill Tilden, and other famous members of the Golden Age. The films had the authentic flavor We were moving along full steam ahead when the first sound picture, The Jazz Singer with Al Jolson, hit the country. However, the transition to sound didn't take place overnight, and by 1932, when we joined Paramount Pictures on a contract of one picture per month, we were geared for most anything. Graham McNamee, a good friend, handled our first sound commentary. Ted Husing followed, then Bill Slater and a flock of others. The core of our spotlight team evolved around cameraman Russ Irvin and Ernest Kortz, with Rod Warren, who joined us after graduating from Penn State in 29, as our advance man. Our first talking picture in 1929 was a film called Four Aces, in which Tex Rickard introduced four champions, Dempsey, Jones, Tilden, and Hitchcock. Since then, we've run a gamut that includes 123 activities under the classification of sport. We were also the first people to film Cypress Gardens, Florida, when we worked with water skier Dick Pope and his aquacade on skis. I recall especially well two escapades our Sportlight crew undertook. In 1926, we made the one-reeler, The Call of the Wild, in New Brunswick, Canada, with my old Tribune boss, Bill McGeehan, in the role of the heavy. Bill was supposed to be tracking a giant moose through the tundra, muskeg, and blueberry bushes. The combination of Bill's bad heart and non-cooperative moose made it tough sledding. However, the quick minds of Eaton and Warren jackpotted. They rented a particularly noble, if dead, moose from a native guide and propped him up in the densest bush with stilts, baling wire, and ropes. Then Bill banged away with his muzzle loader at the defunct critter. That moose should have shared equal billing with McGeehan. Due to my interest in animals, particularly wild animals of all types, I've long been partial to our films dealing with them. In this connection, two of my closest friends have been Ross Allen, a feature contributor, who heads the Florida Reptile Institute, and the late Raymond Dittmars, curator of the Bronx Zoo. 
Allen has not only captured alive several thousands of rattlesnakes, but wrestles with live alligators and knows thoroughly the secrets of the famous Everglades. A very handy man to have around, Allen takes his chances. I was discussing the subject of snakes with Raymond Dittmars, the curator of the Bronx Zoo, over a cocktail at the Chatham Hotel in New York one day. We agreed that the water snake from the Gulf of Mexico was about as deadly as they come when the subject of cobras came up. How high can a cobra strike, I asked. I believe it's no farther than the height of his arc. You might be right, conceded Dittmars. Let's find out. A short time later, we were at the Bronx Zoo. Dittmars started into the cobra enclosure. He was armed with nothing more than a broom. I with four martinis. I mumbled something about discretion being the safest part of valor. Nonsense, retorted the snake man, practically dragging me in with him. Three of the hooded devils were taking a siesta, but Dittmars pushed them with his broom and started herding them into one corner. I was standing with my back to the door when the third cobra, with a mind of his own, started on an end sweep in my direction. Bill, I wheezed, you're a snake short. So saying, I backed out of that door so quickly, I tripped and fell outside the door. I never did get to measure the cobra's proclivity as a broad jumper. Here today is one of the prime movers of Granny Rice's sportlight crew, and from the size of him, he must have been able to move plenty. His name is Rod Warren, and he joined the sportlight movie staff back in 1929, the year he graduated from Penn State. Rod Warren, you've been part of the famed sportlight crew for 25 years. How did your association with Granny Rice come about? Well, Jimmy... 1929 was a great year. I had been a theater manager in Philadelphia for just one year. A chap that I knew named Jack Eaton had accepted the, a new job working with Grantland Rice as manager of his new sport lights to be made in sound. He asked me to come along with him as his chief assistant. We all learned about sound pictures that first year, with a 26-picture schedule and about 50,000 miles to travel with a two-ton so-called portable truck, uh, there was very little chance to really get to know Granny. But naturally, we were home sometimes, and strange as it might seem, Granny had a very peculiar idea of where he liked to call his office. He had an enormous office with Condé Nast because he was editor of the American Golfer. It was about six offices in one. But Grant, being the type he was, seemed to like to come over to our little office that was more intimate and chin with us about the various people we had met from time to time and seemed to take a great interest in all of our new experiences. Rod Warren, what were the early days like? Uh, did Granny Rice help you much, uh, directly or indirectly, in your movie work? He was a peculiar employer. He had a peculiar idea. He seemed to feel that he was not a motion picture man, he was a newspaper man. Even though he knew we were fairly new at our business, he didn't make the slightest move towards directing us or giving us an order. Rod Warren, I know the Grantland Rice Sportlight pictures were familiar and favorite shorts through the movie houses of America. What is the status of those films today? Well, the Grantland Rice Sportlight, as you know, was the oldest motion picture series in the history of the industry. It began with the story of the opening of the Yale Bowl in 1920. And naturally, it ended with Grant's sudden death. Only two months previous to this loss... I had resigned from his Sportlight production company and had joined with him in a partnership to produce a new series of sports pictures, or sports adventure stories, I should call them, for the coming color television market. With Grant gone, there seemed at first no one to take his place. But I was fortunate to find a fellow Tennessean and a warm friend of Grant's uh, willing to try anything once. His name, well, Herman Hickman, uh, the so-called poet laureate of the Smokies. And as you know, just the right size for bigger screens and bigger pictures. 
Again, Rod Warren, in your mind, what was the greatest quality that Granny Rice had? Well, Jimmy, to my mind, he had no single outstanding quality. He had a rare and a very unusual mixture of qualities, seldom encountered in these days. Perhaps his greatest qualities were negative ones. Let's look at it this way. First of all, he never took advantage of anyone, either fairly or unfairly. Secondly, his only fear seemed to be the fear that his words or actions might hurt someone. He avoided debates and criticisms like the plague itself. And now he's gone. And after 25 years of close association, I can't tell you how a man with these attributes could possibly reach the highest pinnacle of success in such a competitive, wrangling field. Rod Warren, thanks for giving us the inside picture of the famed Sportlight sports movies and from one who was there nearly all the way. And now, until our next chapter, this is Jimmy Powers Transcribe saying so long for now. <laughs>